it's available on the web, and I've got some copies here in Davos. If anyone wants to come up afterwards, we can make arrangements to get one to you. I think if you do read it, you'll see that it's um, rather more than earlier efforts to deal with a whole range of disarmament, non-proliferation, and peaceful uses issues. Uh, this is very comprehensive. It's, I hope, very accessible. And I hope it will also be seen as very pragmatic in its assessment um, of what's doable in this very difficult real world that's out there and won't be seen just as a wish list of, of ideals. That said, there is a wish list running through this. The basic themes of the report are that we cannot afford to be complacent about the scale of the risk associated with continued existence and possible proliferation of nuclear weapons. Despite one of those charts you saw up there coming in, which suggests that there's been a dramatic decline in the number of warheads, yes, there has been, from the 70,000 or so that existed at the height of the Cold War to the 23,000 we have at the moment. But frankly, for the last 10 years, we've really been sleepwalking as an international community in making uh, further commitments to reduce that gigantic arsenal, which does have the capacity to wipe the world out many times over and rather more quickly than climate change. The um, basic theme, again, of the report is that, in terms of non-complacency, is that it's sheer dumb luck that we haven't had <coughs> a nuclear catastrophe, nuclear explosion, nuclear weapons uh, since the Second World War. Nothing much to do with good policy, good management or anything else. The more we learn about the Cold War years and the number of times we came close to catastrophe, uh, the more disconcerting it gets, particularly when you appreciate that the command and control arrangements of some of the more <coughs> recent nuclear armed states are not nearly as sophisticated or as extensive as those that existed during the Cold War period between Russia and the United States, and when we think of the way in which um, the sophistication of potential cyber attacks and so on make the, uh, the possibility of misuse of nuclear weapons really very real indeed. The, the, the array of risks that we're dealing with are not only the possible misuse of the existing stockpiles, but of course uh, the prospect of more countries coming to join that status, nuclear armed states, uh, the risks associated with nuclear terrorism, and the risks associated with the peaceful use of nuclear energy, which are expected to expand quite dramatically over the next uh, 20 or 30 years, for reasons you're all familiar with, and which does rail, raise real concerns about proliferation, particularly if we can't get our act together when it comes to uh, somehow internationalising the supply of fuel at the front end and reprocessing at the back end. There is another session on uh, managing nuclear energy this afternoon, which some of you in the audience are moderating or participating in. And uh, we'll leave, I guess, those themes to be picked up in that session this afternoon and focus essentially on the disarmament and non-proliferation uh, part of the story. Um, in that context, I think the final word to say about the, the themes of this report and where we perhaps ought to be going is that it was very well articulated in the Canberra Commission 10 years ago and in Blix Commission a number of other reports since and it's again the basic theme of this report and it really can be summarised in three sentences as follows. So long as any state has nuclear weapons, others will want them. In other words, the, the concept of non-proliferation and disarmament are really joined at the hip. They're equal sides of the same coin. You can't expect uh, to sustain the position on non-proliferation unless you can move on disarmament, and that's one of the themes we want to pull out this morning. Um, second sentence, so long as any state has nuclear weapons, they're bound one day to be used by accident or miscalculation, if not by design. And thirdly, that any such use, any such use, would be catastrophic for life on this planet as we know it. We come to uh, this year with rather high hopes that the world will move forward rather more dramatically, with rather more commitment towards achieving the ultimate goal of a world without nuclear <coughs> weapons. As a result, we come to it as a result of the, uh, the very encouraging uh, emergence on the scene last year of the United States President with a very real personal commitment to this re-articulated in his State of the Union speech uh, this week, and a Russian President, uh, Medvedev, who's <coughs> on the face of it, uh, taken him at his word and started to meet the challenge of a major new uh, move towards uh, serious nuclear disarmament. But if, 20, if 2009 was the year of, of articulation of hopes, 
2010, this year, really is the, the year of delivery. And I think, uh, again, if we can bring out some of these themes in the course of our discussion over the next hour, um, it would be helpful. And we need to remember just how important this year is. Uh, there's a whole series of milestones. This month, we're hoping for the conclusion of the Russia-US bilateral uh, start follow-on arms reduction negotiations. And it's absolutely critical that that be bedded down and that it be followed by the commencement of a further round of negotiations because we've still got huge stockpiles, 22,000 weapons of those countries just between the two of them, 95% of the world's total. Second thing that's happening this year is the nuclear posture review uh, is about to be uh, published in March uh, by the US government, which will be quite critical in its treatment of the issue of nuclear doctrine. What are nuclear weapons for? If there's a continuation of the current American position, which strategic ambiguity, nuclear weapons uh, should be available to deal with all sorts of threat contingencies, non-nuclear as well as nuclear, then I think many of us feel, certainly those of us who wrote this report, that we're not going to make much forward movement. If the Obama administration does hang its hat on a rather more limited approach to uh, what the role of nuclear weapons are, as was foreshadowed in his Prague speech, then that will be a big step forward and will be tremendously helpful going into the NPT review conference. The third thing that's happening, of course, is the Obama Nuclear Security Summit uh, in April, addressing the issues of loose weapons material and the need to be absolutely confident about the secure status of that material, a huge issue in its own right and a relevant building block for both non-proliferation and disarmament in the future. Then, of course, the NPT Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference in May, the five-yearly event on which all eyes are currently focused in the hope that we will avoid a repeat of the debacle of the last conference in 2005 and that this will really generate momentum for the NPT agenda. We'll begin with the discussion of that. Next thing that we're looking to happen this year, but God knows whether it will and all the signs are rather doubtful, I'm afraid, is US Senate ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, another crucial building block for both disarmament and non-proliferation, but badly caught up in US domestic politics in a way that's uh, making the outlook now look rather gloomy indeed uh, for that happening. But if it can be done this year, that would be a hugely important milestone, which will hope, uh, hopefully uh, generate really uh, the momentum that's needed to bring that treaty finally into force. And the other thing, of course, finally, and not least at all of the things that have got to happen this year, is some kind of resolution of the Iran uh, issue. North Korea as well is trundling along as a very difficult and disconcerting non-proliferation breakout issue. Uh, but Iran is, of course, the, uh, the case that's on everybody's mind. And let's try and spend at least a little time exploring the dimensions of that in the discussion that we have and what's doable uh, to avoid uh, Iran becoming a fully-fledged new nuclear arms state. We have a terrific uh, panel to uh, address these issues, um, starting, if I may, with um, Yukia Amano, the newly appointed Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, a formidable act to follow in with Mohammed El Baradai, uh, but I think we can all be extremely uh, confident that um, Mr Amano will uh, fill those shoes and expand the role fulfill the role in, a, in, a, in an excellent way because he's had an outstanding record in arms control disarmament issues over many years. Mr Romano, can I just ask you to, to open up by saying from, from your perspective as head of the IAEA, um, what would you like to see happening at the NPT review conference? What do you think must happen? And in particular, uh, what would you like to see happen so far as the, uh, the role of the IAEA itself is concerned? Thank you very much. Um, this is, uh, is a very difficult and challenging year for me. I am new, so I have to learn a lot of things. Uh, soon I will have uh, my, the first Board of Governors meeting in March in which Iranian nuclear issue will be taken up. Then we'll have uh, the Nuclear Energy Summit in Paris. Uh, in April, uh, we have um, uh, the, uh, the Security Summit in Washington. And in May, uh, we'll have uh, the 2010 NPT Review Conference. Uh, this year, we have um, a series of um, important events. Among these um, uh, events, NPT uh, Review Conference is one of uh, the most important. Uh, I was involved in the process of uh, NPT Review Conference since 1995. 
and I missed two um, preparatory committees, but otherwise I attended all, and in 2007, I chaired the preparatory committee. Um, uh, in light of my experience, um, I think uh, what is uh, lacking in the MPT uh, is the confidence. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the um, confidence in the MPT is uh, threatened um, because of um, uh, the failure of reaching agreement in 2005, the um, frustration uh, against uh, the low, slow progress of nuclear disarmament, and um, um, various um, uh, non nuclear non proliferation issues. My expectation uh, to uh, the MPT this year is that um, the MPT review conference will agree something, some document. Um, just discussing is not enough. We may not need uh, to agree on a fat, thick document like uh, the final documents in 2095. But uh, without having uh, some concrete agreed document, uh, we may have difficulty in claiming uh, that 2010 review conference was, is a success. Uh, in doing so, I would like to draw attention to one point. For many people, MPT review conference is equal uh, to, uh, to uh, disarmament. Disarmament is very important. But um, uh, in the past, at least, the key element <coughs> was Middle East. Uh, Middle East um, uh, nuclear weapon free zone. Uh, in 1995, when MPT was extended, um, uh, there was an agreement uh, to address this issue. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, addressing uh, the, um, uh, this issue of um, nuclear weapon free zone in Middle East is extremely important uh, to decide uh, the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, 2000 outcome of 2010 review conference. On the part of um, um, uh, IAEA, um, in fact, uh, we cover two thirds of the MPT. Um, MPT has uh, three chapters, uh, three pillars, disarmament, non-proliferation, and peaceful use, and we cover non-proliferation and peaceful uses. Uh, we all, I myself will attend uh, the meeting. I will send very capable staff uh, to assist uh, the uh, chairperson um, um, uh, to support him. Um, uh, we are committed to do our utmost uh, to help the chairman um, to ensure the success uh, of the MPT 2010 Review Conference. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Banner. What do you see as the prospects for getting agreement on some, the need to significantly strengthen some aspects of the NPT <coughs> treaty regime, in particular take up of the additional protocol, giving us much stronger uh, capacity for uh, monitoring and verification of what's going on, and secondly, the <coughs> issue of tougher processes to deal with those who shelter under the protection of the NPT, as it were, but then break out having had capacity to develop uh, fissile material or whatever during that period, the, the North Korea and possibly Iran cases. They're the two big, biggest issues on the, uh, the agenda of those who want to see strengthening. What's your judgment about the likelihood of that, those changes and others occurring? First, um, uh, regarding uh, the additional protocol, um, additional protocol is not a legal obligation but um, um, implementing, ratifying and implementing uh, the additional protocol is uh, indispensable uh, to, uh, for the IAEA to have the confidence uh, that all the activities in a country in question is exclusively uh, for peaceful purpose. So uh, I would like to see uh, that as many countries as possible uh, will ratify and implement uh, the additional protocol. Uh, when um, I was appointed as uh, the, uh, the Director General, I said my immediate target uh, is that uh, 100 uh, countries uh, will uh, ratify uh, additional protocol. Uh, I was um, told that it is too modest 
uh, as an objective, but 100 countries is a benchmark. And um, uh, I, uh, I'm um, uh, advocating an incremental approach at, at, uh, uh, to expand uh, the implementation of additional protocol. Um, uh, do we need um, uh, the, uh, the uh, stronger uh, authorities? Um, uh, in the future, perhaps, yes. But uh, for the time being, uh, the problem that we are facing is that uh, in uh, certain cases, implementation of comprehensive safeguard is already difficult. Uh, uh, I said uh, 100 is, some, is the next uh, benchmark, but only 93 um, uh, countries uh, are implementing IAEA uh, additional protocol, whereas uh, the number of the member states are 100, uh, 1551. Um, this is about uh, additional protocol. Additional protocol is an indispensable tool. Um, I would like to see as many countries as possible uh, will adhere uh, to uh, the additional protocol. Um, but uh, for now, implementing comprehensive safeguard and additional protocol is uh, the immediate uh, 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 work that I need to do. Uh, for them, uh, Iran and uh, DPLK, seeing from uh, West, uh, Iran is um, uh, the number one most important uh, dominant issue. Seeing from um, uh, the, the region where I come from, uh, North Korean uh, nuclear issue is also important. Uh, these two issues, nuclear issues, are different uh, by nature. Uh, regarding uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Iranian uh, uh, nuclear issues, um, uh, the uh, origin is uh, the undeclared activities uh, for 20 years. Because of um, uh, these activities, uh, confidence uh, in Iranian nuclear activities is lost uh, in the international community. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the essence of the problem. Um, what we need to do uh, is uh, to uh, uh, clarify uh, the uh, past uh, activities. We call it outstanding issues. We have not yet clarified everything. Um, uh, lots of issues have been clarified, but there still remain some issues uh, that need to be clarified. Com uh, comprehensive uh, safeguard uh, should be uh, uh, fully implemented, and uh, that is um, uh, what uh, we are struggling now. Uh, in case of Iran, uh, there are a um, uh, uh, number of um, uh, resolutions by the Board of Governors, which is not mandatory, uh, as well as uh, the UN Security Council resolutions, which are mandatory. Uh, these um, resolutions uh, should be implemented. Um, my last point is that uh, we have been, uh, especially my predecessor, Dr. Mohammed El Baladai, uh, was, um, 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 uh, was working as a good office uh, to, uh, to work out a deal on, on the supply of fuel uh, to uh, the Tehran research reactor. This is not um, a safeguard issue, but IAEA has the obligation to facilitate uh, the supply of um, uh, nuclear uh, fuel. And um, a proposal is made, but um, uh, it is not yet agreed. Um, I hope uh, the agreement will be reached, and I continue to work um, as an intermediary. Uh, this will uh, help uh, to uh, increase uh, the confidence among the parties concerned. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Mano. We'll refer, come back to the Iran issue, I suspect, a number of times before the hour is out. But turning to you now, Graham Allison, Harvard Kennedy School, very well known and established uh, expert and writer on nuclear policy issues for many years. Is the US going to deliver on the Obama Prague speech? agenda, or is that just a, a rather empty hope uh, at this stage? More specifically, um, what do you think the US can and will bring to the NPT review conference on the particular issue of disarmament, given the long perception by the non-nuclear weapon states of foot dragging on the disarmament issue by the weapon states? The most recent instance of that, I guess, being the uh, famous UN Security Council Resolution 1887, which while brilliantly expansive and highly credible on addressing non-proliferation security issues, is almost completely silent uh, in terms of the disarmament issue. What leadership can we expect uh, the US to, to bring to the NPT review conference in that context? 
Well, th thank you, uh, Gareth. Uh, I would I'd, uh, first uh, say congratulations to you and your co-author on this commission report, which I think uh, uh, actually in a more comprehensive fashion than any of the reports that I've seen previously manages to connect uh, the many different dimensions of this problem. And I think that's, uh, that's done a great service in reminding us how everything connects to everything else. Uh, and uh, also uh, why there's an urgency about all this. Uh, now with respect to President Obama's commitment I think it's a, an amazing thing, but the U.S. has an American president now for whom this is a, a, a high priority issue. Um, I think if you wake him up at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, what is the most significant threat to American security or international security, he'll say nuclear weapons and a nuclear explosion destroying a city. If you ask what did he talk about in his first international speech in Prague, it was about nuclear danger. Uh, what did he talk about when he was chairing the Security Council in September? He said, we're going to just have one topic. We're going to talk about nuclear security. He got a, a, a unanimous uh, a UN Security Council resolution, very bold on that topic. In his State of the Union just uh, this week, uh, uh, with all the other things that he's got to think about and talk about. If I just quote, uh, quote a line here, he says, even as we prosecute two wars, we are confronting perhaps the greatest danger to the American people, the threat of nuclear weapons. And then he goes on to say that he's embraced the vision of Kennedy and Reagan for a strategy that reverses the spread of weapons and seeks a world without them. So I think with respect to the to, to the commitment of mind and heart, there's no, uh, no ambiguity, whatever. I think, as you said, uh, 2010 is the year of uh, from words to deeds. And the deeds are much more difficult than the words. If I'm making a forecast, I would say the nuclear posture review, which will come out shortly, which you identified, uh, will disappoint some people, but will be much more forthcoming in this domain for people who really are familiar with the details, then most people would, it'll be the most forthcoming nuclear posture review ever with respect to this set of issues. Uh, I think with respect to the uh, US-Russian uh, next step in arms control reduction, it's a disappointment that the treaty hasn't been reached so far. I think there's a number of mistakes that have been made, but a, an agreement will be reached, I think, shortly. It'll make a modest reduction in the number of weapons, probably from, the current uh, ceiling is 2250 each. It'll probably be 1750, and it'll also uh, 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 initiate a further round of further reductions. So, uh, I think coming to your question on the NPT review conference, uh, the U.S. is acutely conscious that 2005 uh, uh, was a bust, as as Kofi Annan said and that in this perverse manner, which I think was largely a function of American incompetence, uh, uh, where the, th the, the international threat was Iran uh, and needed to be the, the focus of the spotlight, the U.S. managed uh, by reverse jujitsu to get itself to be the problem. Uh, and so most of the parties thought the U.S. was more difficult than what the problems really were. So I think the U.S. is conscious of that, and I think we'll be trying to come into the uh, review conference forward-leaning. If I could just make one, one other small point, I think the, the most uh, uh, worrisome for me about this topic is I think for sure we have now a president who's got it. Uh, for sure he's got a team of people who are working on this extremely hard every day. This notion of this nuclear security summit that's going to be held at the beginning of April in Washington with 44 new heads of state, or 44 heads of state invited for the first time ever to a topic, to a conference that's on only one topic, nuclear security and how we can be sure all nuclear weapons and all nuclear material everywhere is secured to a gold standard so that it can't get into the hands of thieves or terrorists and therefore be used, which is an essential element in all this. Okay, so I'd say we have that. <coughs> what, what worries me as a, as a scholar studying this or watching it over time 
Is that against the underlying trend lines on the other hand? And the underlying trend lines that are most worrisome to me are uh, North Korea, which now has 10 bombs worth of plutonium and has conducted two tests and seems uh, immune to any of the discussion of what's going on, you know, on our agenda. And Iran, which has been uh, the subject of five Security Council resolutions, has been sanctioned three times, and which appears to be unaffected at all by this. So today has 4,000 centrifuges spinning, uh, produces another six pounds of uh, low enriched uranium every day, has two bombs worth of LEU now if it were further. Uh, and Pakistan, if we want to take the most troublesome of all to me, which has tripled its arsenal of nuclear weapons and materials over the last, uh, whatever, eight, eight years, while it's become an increasingly less stable state. So as, if I just put it in a metaphor, I think the, the mountaintop is a world without nuclear weapons. And I think the, the revival of interest in that vision is to be applauded. I think that's fantastic. But there's the simultaneous problem of the avalanche, uh, which is one's trying to walk up the mount to the mountaintop from one base camp to the other. There's all this potential of an avalanche, which if it should occur, I think will leave us much further down the mountain. So I think trying to figure out how we connect the bigger picture that we're talking about on the on the disarmament front and the NPT review conference to these very specific urgent issues of Iran, North Korea, and Pakistan to just take three, maybe could be part of our conversation. Thanks very much, Graham. Can I turn out to Yan Shui Tong from Tsinghua University and very distinguished uh, figure in academic discourse on this issue and a very important contributor to, uh, to this report, Xinhua, for which I, I thank you very much. Um, China's always had a strong position of support for nuclear <coughs> weapons free world, uh, a very modest arsenal, uh, 200 or so weapons if we knew, and that's one of the issues, transparency. Um, surely, uh, you know, much, much less than <coughs> Russia and, uh, and the United States and has never joined in in the past that competitive race. But what can we expect in terms of actual serious support commitment from China now to this goal of a nuclear weapons free world, given that there seems to be a fair amount of evidence that China is modernising, expanding its nuclear arsenal, given that there's a fair amount of criticism, for better or worse, directed against China for dragging its feet a bit on the question of sanctions against Iran in the present environment. and. Um, issues in the past about the relationship with Pakistan and so on. What can we hope and expect for from China, given your new leadership position in the world on this particular issue, not least going into the NPT review conference and getting strong outcomes from that conference? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, <coughs> actually, I think the, if we will look at the, uh, the, <coughs> pic the general picture, we'll find that the situation uh, developed in opposite direction. In terms of uh, nuclear arsenals, the war has a, is a declining, because you have the tr uh, uh, figure shows to us. And uh, on the other hand, uh, horizontally, you find the number of the country possess nuclear weapons are increasing, right? It goes to the two uh, different uh, opposite directions. So why the, and so if you're talking about the, what the China can contribute to the elimination of nuclear weapons, I think we can talk, we, we have to talk in the two, op, uh, two different uh, uh, dimensions. In terms of the <coughs> uh, reducing the arsenal, nuclear arsenals, I think China will possibly join the uh, disarmament when the U.S. and the Russia uh, reduce their substantially reduce their nuclear weapons under 50, uh, uh, under 500. And when U.S. and the Russia keep their nuclear arsenals uh, uh, over a thousand, I think it's a very difficult for China to join. And even the, I don't know the numbers, even the numbers as the international community suggested, uh, China possesses uh, 240 something. And then I don't think China will join the disarmament when the US and the Russia uh, possess uh, over 1,000 uh, nuclear weapons. So when they reduce to 500, that makes sense. Second, concerning the, <coughs> the uh, uh, stop the proliferation of the nuclear technology and uh, to the non nuclear states means at the horizontal level, I think that there's a something and really concern how to do it. 
And uh, in this book, and uh, uh, Gary's used the eliminating the nuclear uh, uh, threat <coughs> and as the title for the book, actually the highest goal is the elimination. And then you can re uh, lower down the goal from elimination to minimization. And then you can further down to the freezing the nuclear arsenals. <coughs> it means that uh, maintain the current status quo. And then you can even lower the goal to what? Slow down the process, uh, uh, the, the speed of the uh, proliferation. Why I'm talking about the lower goals rather than talking the higher goals? The experience that we gain from the North Korea's nuclear uh, program is that when we set up a very desirable, very high political goals, and uh, related to the North Korea, is a denuclearization of the North Korean uh, Peninsula. And then what happened? Nuclear, North Korea had, uh, uh, had the second uh, nuclear test. Actually, after the first nuclear test, the six-party talk has a chance to prevent North Korea to carry out the second nuclear t uh, test. Unfortunately, I don't know why, maybe politically uh, correct, and no one talking about prevent North Korea to have the second nuclear test. They still keep the very high and uh, political goal to denuclearize, uh, 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 dismantle North Korea's nuclear facilities. Actually, when they keep that a high political goal and do not have the practical measures to achieve that, it means uh, you cannot prevent North Korea to moving on its own track. And so that's why, from my understanding that, if we should have a diff different layers of the political goal for the uh, nuclear, uh, 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 non-nuclear uh, uh, proliferation. The second thing, and, uh, and also a lesson we can learn from six-party talk. From the very beginning, and six-party talk try to confuse and oh, try to make this uh, uh, nuclear, North Korea's nuclear issue is, uh, uh, as confusing as possible. They do not want to clarify this is security issue. They want to make it as a problem linked to the development. So from the very beginning, and the six-party talk, I mean, so all the party, uh, participants of six-party talk try to talk to North Korea, how much you will sell it. So they're talking about economic aid. So how much you want, and how much money you want from this. And they, when North Korea said, no, I don't want to sell my nuclear uh, uh, program, they said, OK, if you don't want to sell your nuclear uh, uh, program, you do not want to gain. We are forcing you to lose money. So they're talking about economic sanction. So from the very beginning, they concerned that they use the money to force North Korea to give up nuclear weapons. So from my understanding, that's a failure. That's the reason for the failure. And uh, from the very beginning, if they, when they do not want to very clear, uh, clarify the nature of a nuclear proliferation is a security issue, and I'll try to link it with the economic development, then you just make the things more difficult rather than make it easier. Why I want to uh, emphasize on, uh, on this. These things happened after North Korea had a, a second nuclear test. The major powers find that they can no longer stop North Korea moving on its own track. So they changed the policy, and all these major powers started to improve the relationship with North Korea rather than resist on the old policy. Even for France, sent an envoy to North Korea to talking about uh, how to normalize its relationship between, uh, uh, with the North Korea. And, but they, they never talking about normalization with North Korea before the second nuclear test. So this, this what does it mean? It means that it, the North Korea set a model for Iran. Yeah. Tell the Iran that, hey, you resist on that. As long as you have nuclear bombs, all these guys change their attitude towards you. And why the major powers change their attitude about North Korea after the second nuclear test? Because from the very beginning, they concern this is not a security issue. This is something we can buy. Uh, actually, if we want to make this uh, non-nuclear uh, states do, uh, do not have this uh, motivation or dynamic for processing nuclear weapons, we must uh, looking for the security approaches, security measures 
to solve this problem rather than looking for the monetary issues, a uh, monetary approaches to solve the problem. Now, the, the, uh, the positive experience we have is that why we can get more than, a five, uh, uh, more than 100 countries join this uh, uh, NPT treaty because uh, the nuclear powers provide both a positive and a negative security guarantee for these countries. That means you provide security for them, make them sure, okay, you will never face the threat from us, and we guarantee that. If, if, someone, impose a, if someone attacked you, and we will attack that guy, we punish that guy, we will stand at your side. So you provide security guarantee, and then these non-secure states will feel safe. They will give up their rights to possess nu uh, uh, nuclear weapons. So if this, uh, act this uh, positive uh, uh, lessons, we, we must concern how we uh, apply this uh, kind of uh, straight uh, approaches to dealing with uh, those countries are still have this uh, uh, motivation for having nuclear weapons. I think I have talked too long. Thank you. Well, I'll ask you to talk just a tiny bit longer to respond to one very familiar criticism or suggestion that's made that if China really wanted to heavy North Korea into conformity with the world's desire that it denuclearize, it could do so because you've got the kind of leverage over the country that nobody else has. How do you specifically respond to that very familiar criticism? Well, if I uh, <clears throat> if I'm talking about uh, uh, the China's policy toward the uh, North Korea's nuclear issues, I think uh, we made a uh, one mistake. The mistake is that we follow American suggestion. And we mis, uh, mis, uh, mis, uh, 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 led by the U.S. from the new security issue to the economic issue, and uh, frequently talking about sanctions and economic aid, rather than talking about the security, who provides security for North Korea. And then from, for, the sixth, for the sixth round of discussion of six-party talks, no one wants to talk about who provides security for North Korea. How can we guarantee that no one attacked it? During the, the, seven, uh, uh, during the uh, uh, four years of discussion, and uh, <clears throat> uh, at least some participants of Six Party Talk continuously to talking about how to change the regime, how to get rid of that regime, how to change the society, how to, gather, uh, 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 how to uh, uh, get this, uh, this government uh, uh, from the surface of the earth. So when you're talking about uh, how to kill this guy, how can you tell the guy, hey, don't have the weapons? That's very difficult. So from answer, if you want this guy to lay down his weapons, you might say, okay, no one is, no one is going to kill you. So from answer, from the, the, the if we, you, if you say what China can do, I think China should insist on his own policy rather than to follow U.S. suggestion too closely. Well. Lots of other questions from me and no doubt others in the audience, but Larry Brilliant, your civil society guru extraordinaire, epidemiologist, long background with Google now, with the Skoll Global Threats Fund. From your perspective, um, as a civil society observer of all of this primarily, <coughs> what can be done to energise a more uh, public enthusiasm, commitment for these issues, given their gravity. We all know this is an issue that really has gone off the boil <coughs> since the, uh, the grand days of the Older Muston marches and the uh, unilateral disarmament movements. It's not a major, major issue out there in people's consciousness. How, how can we make it such? Thank you very much, Garrett. Um, first of all, I just want to thank you because I think your point about uh, the way the world treats North Korea becomes a blueprint for how Iran will respond. I think that was an extremely important uh, observation. Um, you know, uh, we're besieged with so many threats. Uh, the pandemic this year, global warming, and now we're in this strange position where the worst of all, nuclear, uh, the nuclear threat has trouble getting itself heard. Uh, it, it's very strange if you think about that. Uh, and uh, we've heard a lot about statecraft today and not much about uh, you know, public will. Uh, and I think that's necessarily so, certainly for disarmament, perhaps a little bit less so for nuclear proliferation. There are, after all, 39 or 40 nation states 
that have the ability to create a nuclear weapon almost immediately should they desire to do so, but they haven't done so. So I think there's something to explore in the area of public opinion and public will. And the world has changed. It is now a world of Facebook and Twitter and, and Google. And we are able to communicate uh, uh, across nation boundaries. And there is a movement today, uh, perhaps not as visible in the street as there was in the 60s and the 70s, but there is a movement towards zero. And zero is a number that I like very much. I worked for 10 years uh, in the smallpox eradication program where our target was zero. I think that is the right target for, for nuclear weapons. And just a couple of things that are influencing this zeitgeist, um, this movement towards zero. It's real, it's palpable. Um, one of the uh, meetings that everyone has discussed is this meeting in Paris next week of Global Zero, where there are hundreds of uh, military and uh, heads of state and nuclear experts who are gathering in Paris uh, in furtherance of this goal of, of Global Zero. Um, the Nobel Prize that we talked about for Obama is actually the third Nobel Prize that has been given in two decades uh, for people who are working to uh, rid the world of nuclear weapons. That contributes to the zeitgeist. There are two movies coming out uh, this month about uh, nonproliferation, and one of them is called Countdown to Zero. It's made by the same people who made the movie Inconvenient Truth. And uh, without going into too many of the details of it, I will tell you that uh, in, to Gareth's point about dumb luck, uh, one of the most uh, emotionally compelling moments in that movie deals with Boris Yeltsin and a decision that he made that could easily have gone the other way. And uh, you may put it in the category of good stewardship or dumb luck, but it certainly is a very compelling moment. And then another movie which is financed by Warren Buffett, the second wealthiest person in the world, uh, which is called The Nuclear uh, Tipping Point. Um, so, so there's many things that are uh, contributing to this zeitgeist of uh, feeling in the public will that talking about zero is not facile, it's not naive, it's not impossible. Um, if you read this amazing report, which I have been cramming, I must admit, over the last couple of nights, uh, this also gives legitimacy to the, the concept of talking about zero. And I think that you will see more and more of that in the coming year. I think maybe 2009 was the articulation of the promise. You may be right that 2010 is the year of implementation. But I think one of the things that will be implemented is this greater social conversation about how do we get to zero. Thanks, Larry. Can I just ask you one other very specific question, given your status as one of the world's really leading experts on biological weapons, biological warfare and the potential. We often hear as part of the argument for retaining broad nuclear doctrine, nuclear deterrent doctrine, uh, that this is one of the, the threats, that of biological uh, weapons, biological warfare, that we need to retain nuclear weapons to deal with. This is a particularly popular sentiment in Northeast Asia in the context, context of potential uh, misuse of biological weapons, perhaps by the North Koreans. Um, what do you say about that, about the utility of nuclear weapons as any kind of deterrent for that very serious threat contingency? I think it's absurd. Um, but, but it does go the other way. I, I, I will tell you of an anecdote. Uh, uh, because of smallpox, I was once asked to have uh, lunch with uh, President Gorbachev, and we talked a bit about uh, the Soviets' work on... Uh, on smallpox as an offensive weapon, a bioweapon. And I asked him if it was true that he had signed a five-year plan to release over two billion US dollars equivalent to create what we call a chimera, a hybrid, half smallpox and half Ebola, so that it could be transmissible like smallpox and kill like Ebola. And you, you have to ask yourself, where in the human imagination does such a horrific idea come from, and I asked him if he had in fact signed the, the documents to release that. And he took off his glasses and he, he had a big sigh and he said, um, in, in Russian, he said, it's true. It was the hardest decision of my life. But your president, Ronald Reagan, said that he would spend us into the Stone Age on nuclear weapons. And indeed he was succeeding when my generals came to me and said, President Gorbachev, we must have something in our back pocket. 
and they proposed this biological weapon to be in the back pocket as a deterrent for nuclear weapons. And you, you can see the logic of that. It is a poor man's nuclear weapon. So I understand the logic of a bioweapon <coughs> as a credible deterrent <coughs> to nuclear weapons, but I don't understand it the other way around. Thanks very much. Well, the vast tapestry of issues have been opened up. Let's throw it across to the audience now Can for questions and comment, unless anyone on the panel would like to come in. Uh, Mr. Manu. I tried not to speak as a Japanese national, um, but as a representative of the international organization. But allow me to say one small thing as a Japanese national or a national coming from a non-nuclear weapon state. You said that you cannot buy a policy by money. That is true, I accept it. But you also said that non-nuclear weapon states became a member of the MPT because protection is offered. That I cannot agree. If you cannot buy, buy policy by money, you cannot buy policy by protection either. Why Japan became a member of the MPT because we thought it's a good thing. We are the only country that suffered nuclear catastrophe. Eliminating nuclear weapons is a uh, good cause. <coughs> for that cause, we became a member of the NPT. It was not for economical reason. It is not uh, for protection offered by your country or by others. We believe it is a good thing. And we want to continue to believe that NPT it's a good treaty. This is a question of confidence. As far as we can believe that, and other non-nuclear weapon states can believe that MPT is functioning well, going into the right direction, MPT has the strength. The same thing can be said about IAEA. If people can believe that breaches of rules is not accepted, Right of peaceful use is um, uh, is um, <coughs> um, is um, 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 not um, uh, undermined. Then uh, people can believe IAEA is a good good organization. Confidence is the problem. That's why I said in the MPT review conference, confidence is needed. For the IAEA, also confidence is needed. You are right. You cannot buy. Uh, policy by money, but you cannot buy policy um, uh, by uh, by protection either, and uh, you cannot talk on behalf of the non-nuclear weapon states. Okay, questions? Yes, A.D. Letter. Um, thank you. Um, I have uh, to Mr. Amano. Um, you talked about um, some agreements. Um, hopefully emerging from the NPT. I wonder if you could be a little more broadly specific of what you might like to see or what you hope might come out. And also, um, I was quite fascinated by your following comment when you said that you believe that a nuclear weapons-free zone in the Middle East is going to be a big issue. Um, do you see anything possibly coming out on this, and how could it possibly happen without Israel as a member of the NPT? And to Professor Yan, um, you raised the issue of security guarantees being one of the issues that should really have been discussed in the North Korea nuclear context. I wonder if you could tell us whether you have any ideas on who should be providing these and how it should be done. Okay, Mr. Manu. Yes, um, it is some uh, premature um, uh, to say uh, what should be the, the element uh, in the uh, agreement. But um, uh, of course, uh, we cannot expect uh, that um, uh, nuclear weapons disappear tomorrow. We cannot expect uh, that uh, 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 a nuclear weapon free zone uh, in Middle East will be realized uh, tomorrow. But um, uh, I come back to uh, what I said. Uh, the confidence uh, that things are going into right direction is 
needed. Um, we need to go into the direction of elimination of nuclear weapons <coughs> as stipulated by in Article 6. Uh, we need uh, to see um, uh, that uh, to be able to continue to hope uh, that um, uh, progress will be made uh, to establish uh, the nuclear weapon free zone in the um, uh, Middle East, as agreed in uh, 1995. So um, uh, these um, aren't, um, uh, nuclear energy uh, should be um, able to be used by developed countries and developing countries uh, too. Uh, these elements are showing uh, and strengthening uh, the confidence of um, in NPT is needed. Thank you. Perhaps I can just add before turning to uh, Dr. Yan on the Middle East weapons of mass destruction free zone issue. This report actually recommends a way forward on that issue based on a regional consultation we had, which included not only the Arab League states, but Iran and Israel, interestingly, all around the same table a few months ago. And um, well, I can't disclose the, the details of that conversation. I think we did all emerge from it with a sense that it might just conceivably be possible to get agreement for a coming out of the NPT review conference to recommend that the UN Secretary General convene a conference of the major regional powers uh, that would be attended by all of them in order to discuss the preconditions or prerequisites for a nuclear or weapons of mass destruction free zone. Far too early to anticipate, would be quixotic to anticipate any serious negotiation towards such a zone given Israel's attitude toward peace process and everything else. But a, a serious exploration of the prerequisites for it would be a significant advance on the 1995 commitment and might just be enough to help deal with that issue at the review conference. The other thing we recommend in this report is that the, the, the three big issues that need to be addressed and resolved and in a positive way at this conference are that issue but, and a serious package of measures of the kind we've, we briefly touched on earlier on, strengthening the NPT regime and the IAEA. And thirdly, a big statement on disarmament uh, to really demonstrate commitment by the weapon states. So that's all in this, if anyone's interested. But uh, Dr. Yan, on the, on the specific question about North Korea. Okay. <clears throat> I think the, uh, the country, the first country can provide security guarantee is uh, South Korea. And uh, during the Kim Ta Jun's uh, period, and when he adopted the sunshine policy toward North Korea, and North Korea uh, signed the joint uh, uh, nuclear uh, de denuclearization treaty with the uh, um, uh, nuclear free, uh, not not uh, Korean Peninsula uh, nuclear free uh, free area treaty, I think so. That case shows that why uh, later on when North uh, South Korea changed their attitudes toward the uh, South Korea, South Korea. Uh, a uh, uh, withdraw from the NPT. And uh, actually, the current South Korea's government uh, abandoned the sunshine policy and uh, uh, resumed uh, the old policy regarded North Korea as an enemy, enemy threat and uh, 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 like that. So uh, the, for the North Korea, they're concerned that's a direct threat. The second country can provide a security guarantee is the United States. and. It, it, Actually, North Korea knows that without U.S. military support, and South Korea dare not to use a military force to, uh, against it. So he wants to uh, uh, normalize his relationship with the United States. That means uh, they want to have an American embassy in Pyongyang as hostage. Unfortunately, Americans said no. I won't send my ambassador to Pyongyang as a hostage there. I do not want to guarantee your security. So that's why. The second thing. The th second thing they want from the United States, they want to have a, a peace treaty. And the uh, U.S. said, no, before, uh, you, before you denuclearize or dismantle your nuclear facilities, we cannot give you that. So for, for North Korea said, OK, if you guarantee no, metro, uh, uh, no, uh, no war, you guarantee no, uh, 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 you won't uh, launch war against me, I, I will concern you. U.S. said, no. And you dis dismantle your weapons first, and then we're talking about uh, the peace treaty. So that, that's to that specific question. And I actually, I also make a, want to make a response to Mr. Um, Amano's uh, uh, speech. I totally agree with you. And if you want a uh, country to join the NPT treaty, you must make them have confidence. 
But then the question is that, how can they have the confidence? The confidence based on what? For instance, the Japan's confidence is based on American's nuclear protection, based on American's nuclear umbrella. Without that nuclear protection, I doubt Japan has a confidence in this. They must have, <clears throat> have a confidence in their own security. Then they have the trust about the NPT treaty. So the sa same thing, the, for the uh, members of uh, non-nuclear free zone, they have the, they have the confidence in, this, uh, in all this uh, uh, non-nuclear uh, non free zone treaty because uh, they have a confidence in their own security. That's a no nuclear attack. No major uh, powers will launch war against them. So for, for, the, for that reason, I think that when we're talking about the confidence, we really need concern. How, to, how can we make these countries have the confidence? If Any, I could just add one, one footnote. Yes, I, would, I agree entirely with the thrust of the comments of Professor Yan. I think going back to the question of uh, whether a state feels adequately secure uh, is a prerequisite for their thinking about their nuclear posture. And I think one of the conundrums that one gets to as you get to the latter stages of trying to seek zero is if states feel greatly insecure in terms of a conventional imbalance, they may often look for nuclear weapons as their equalizer. And indeed, Larry made it even worse, because if nuclear weapons aren't my equalizer, is there anything else out there? What about biological weapons? So the notion that eliminating the weapons will make people secure is theory one. And theory two, which I agree with Professor Yan, is security will make people prepared to eliminate the weapons. So the, the security concerns and confidence about nation security is almost a prerequisite for the actions that one's hoping for. Got to wrap up in under two minutes. Any last comment from other panelists about I, the I issues would, that have been if, raised? If Larry. I could, I just expand on the difference between biological weapons and nuclear weapons. Uh, the, the reason that biological weapons are both the uh, sort of the poor man's uh, nuclear weapon is that they, we've reached a point in technology where, for uh, under ten thousand dollars in almost a high school bench lab, you could create some element of a biological weapon. And the reason that you can't use nuclear weapons against it is you can't tell with bioweapons if it's a state actor, a non-state actor, just a, a, a laboratory error that launches these weapons. So uh, in, in a way, I, I feel like you who have spent your life and worked so hard in this area of nuclear weapons, you have a little advantage. Because while it's difficult to get 200 nation states to agree, it's far easier, in a way, than it is to get the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of potential sources of biological weapons. Hugely complex issues would take hours more discussion to tease it out, but I'd ask you to join me in thanking the panel for having scratched the surface so compellingly. Thank you. Great.